Right, put it down, guys. I know we've got the new Wiggly catalogue in and it is scrumptious, <laughs> but it's Wiggly Podcast 53. get all the ingredients for your organic country lifestyle here i reckon with me on the wiggly sofa is rach farmer phil and i'm heather this week we're going to talk about shooting with farmer phil what does he think of it i know it's a very risky dodgy topic and i'm quite sure that many listeners out there will have loads of opinions on that we're going to have ricky coming in to tell us about those nettles I really like the story of the nettles and I think she's making a recipe so whether we've got something to taste or not I'm not sure. We've had our catalogue critiqued by some experts so we'll talk about that. We've got so many reviews on iTunes that we're going to read some out. Ricardo is still slightly laid up but we did see him yesterday didn't we We did yeah he is well even though (laughs) it's it's funny (laughs) still. We we took him out to lunch, local pub called The Crown at Woolhope. It was delicious yeah. and had a bit of a steak pie with him. He struggled to get into the car, the new he Wiggly Skoda. He struggles to go everywhere, Yeah, <laughs> but we did get him there eventually. So on with the show. So our first review is a four star. Only four? Oh. Oh. Never mm. mind, the good with the bad. Here's the four star review. From Boo Book. Rural information and humour, she says. I've got to hand it to the Wiggly team. Heather rules her podcast with humour and flair, just about containing the bubbling enthusiasm of Ricardo and the quiet cynicism of Farmer Phil. All the while, some quite scary information, such as the Monsanto issue, is brought to our ears. Thank you all and get well soon, Ricardo. That's not bad, is it? That's I think that's one. very fair. I yeah, like that's that. That's a good one. Rach, would you like to read out the five star by Kaz B? Okay. Take time out to listen to this every week. It's a great insight into this fabulous business and the characters behind it. You get to feel like part of their friendly team as you listen to the fun chit chat from the sofa. They also include interesting interviews and priceless snippets of information. I'm completely hooked. Oh, that's nice. And just we're on the ego trip. Here we go, Phil, if you'd like to read out this one, and then we'll spare the listener from too many more until the end of the show. A bunch of lovable loonies, five (laughs) stars. That sounds like us. This looks to be from Wildlife Services. Um, Oh, that's wildlifeservices.co.uk. Ah, yes, Martin. Yeah, if you need a habitat reviewed or, or badger gates put in, he does that. And lots more. And this is Martin, who I was having a discussion with on Glyphosate, wasn't it? That's right. Anyway, Martin writes, The Wiggly Wigglers team are wonderful people, dedicated to their cause of environmentally friendly gardening and composting. The podcast is an amusing and informative collection of quips, anecdotes, arguments, discussions and interviews, usually conducted from the Wiggly Sofa at Lower Blakemere Farm. Heather is the leader of this amazing bunch, with the most amazing and infectious laugh, (laughs) and she is... (laughs) assisted, and that looks as if it's in inverted commas, I don't know why anyway, but assisted by husband Farmer Phil and Richard Ricardo, as well as some of the other members of the team. Long may they continue to amuse and entertain us with their Wiggly podcast. Well, thank you for that, Martin. Oh, enough of that. The thing is, please can you go and review our podcast because it really helps when people are choosing which podcast they want to listen to. And I was thinking that, bearing in mind I've got this new device on my blog called My Chingo, which is where you can record a comment, that if there's anything in the show you disagree with or you want questions answered or you want to tell us what you think, as long as your computer's got a microphone... Go to my blog, wigglywigglers.blogspot.com and press the button and you can record it. And we would love to play you on the show, unless you say something that's awful. In which case, we wouldn't. (laughs) Technology. It's amazing. (laughs) You do have to have a computer with a microphone, though. I said that. That's right, then. The other thing is that we're installing a farm phone. Geekfarmlife.com have got a farm phone. And I've been saying to Michael for so long, oh, I really want a farm phone so folk can phone in and tell us what they think. Anyway, 
It's being installed. And by the time you hear this podcast, there'll be a little man with his spanner in the toolbox at Wiggly Wigglers installing some amazing phone system. He's coming. Thank you, Adrian, from Gordon Harwood. New catalogue day is always one of our favourite days at Wigglers, isn't it, Rach? It is. We can't wait. We rush to get the box to <laughs> open it up to look at the front cover. And what do we think of this one? Love it. Absolutely love it. It's an amazing picture. How could you capture that tongue just going round the dandelion like Oh, that? Rach, I thought you were talking about the picture of me on the back then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, no. <laughs> What lens did he possibly use to get that kind of look, Phil? I don't know, but don't I look slim and handsome? <laughs> I think that's so, the lens. <laughs> <laughs> so does Toast, actually. <laughs> well, I've got to say, listener, that Mark Eccleston, who is one of the photographers, along with John Harding and a couple of others, who send photographs into the Wiggly Wigglers catalogue, Mark Eccleston's actually got the front and the back cover in this issue, the 0607 catalogue. And on the back, we've got Farmer Phil with Toast which I think is a little bit of Michael work. And on the front, we've got the cow just getting the dandelion. And he got this picture. He saw the dandelion, he saw the cow grazing, and he realised that it was coming towards the dandelion. So he lay on the grass and waited and waited and waited. And he got the picture just as the cow was about to eat the dandelion. But I must tell you, folks, that... Yesterday, we went on a multi-channel business seminar to have our catalogue critiqued and learn other stuff. And so there were some experts there and there were some other catalogue companies there. And one of the things that the expert said was that he desperately didn't like the photo on the front. Why was this? He said it was unpleasant. <laughs> What's unpleasant about a lovely cow? Just about a muncher dandelion. I can think of much more unpleasant <laughs> aspects of a cow than that. <laughs> In fact, Phil, they're on your shirt today. <laughs> That's true enough. And on the back cover. <laughs> yes. So I don't think he was our target audience, but perhaps you'd like to let us know what you think. Is the cow good or not? I mean, we love the picture of the cow, but we're willing to listen to listeners' comments. And actually, in the room, he did cause a bit of a stir because many people were saying, well, actually, I really like the cow. I really like the cow. I really do. So let us know. You can either email us, heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk, or you can my chingo me. So tell us what you think of the cow with the dandelion. On the subject of Mark Eccleston, he's actually got an exhibition at Ironbridge, which is in Shropshire. You know about Ironbridge, don't you, Phil? Yep, Thomas Telford, Industrial Revolution, I believe. First iron bridge in the world and largely thought of as to be where modern production started. Just a jolly job, but he's got an exhibition there, 16th, 17th and 18th of November with Jenny, who's the lady who makes all his frames at her gallery. So if you want more details, just email me. And there's some wine there too. And he makes a comment on Podcast 51, which is, I thought the Hallelujah Chorus was just right. I can't imagine not having a poo for a week. <laughs> Although it's not funny, Ricardo falling off his ladder. It would have been if he was cutting his hedge. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know he wasn't? Oh, no, he wasn't. He was dealing with his flashings. No, well. his facing. Facia board. Facia board. Facia board. Yeah. What about inside this catalogue then? Any articles that we like? Because as you know, Wiggly listener, although there's lots of products in our catalogue, there's also loads of articles. Any favourites or pictures you like? Well, I've got to say, Jodie's bit on, on Hay Festival certainly brings back the state of play there with the pouring rain and mud and water everywhere. Never seen anything like it. We didn't eat the Mars bars, did we, Rach? No, it wasn't us. Anything you like, Rach? I particularly like the pictures because the pictures tell stories. Are you on about Marcus Eccleston's photos? Yes. Ah, yeah. yes. Yeah, I think they're great. Well, I like, again, Jodie's article on chicken feed because she reckons that Bukashi is making them outrun the fox. <laughs> Can't see it myself. Uh, no, no, I don't think that'll be... Uh... No, back to the official verdict. Right. They said that they loved our catalogue because it was full of this and that and the other at the critique, 
But where we'd missed out on an opportunity, they felt, was a clear statement of what the heck we're about. They said they didn't get quick enough what we actually did. And they thought that we were appealing to people that had already got information about us or knew about us already. And if they just picked this up, they wouldn't understand it quick enough. That's because of me, because I always like to write loads of stuff about what's in it instead of what we do, possibly. And they also said that we should have clearer navigation from department to department, which is something that Michael's encouraged us to do in the past. And we always say things like, but we like it all much of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be. So it might be. It, it's a Michael um, improvement to be made there. Moving on, we've got Ricky coming in a minute, but the thing that I wanted to ask Phil about was country sports. Oh, what a minefield that is, isn't it? <laughs> I wanted to ask him about his opinion on shooting and how shoots work in this day and age, a little bit about the history of it and how he actually goes shooting and, and what that means to him. Well, shooting, uh, the, the phrase shooting and the activity of shooting encompasses a lot of what I regard as different things. So that at, at one end of the scale, you've got the highly commercial driven pheasant shoots sort of dotted around the country where it's run as a, a mega business and charged a fortune and so on. And at the other end of the scale, you've got whoever going out to pot a few bunnies off or shoot a couple of pigeons around and about. And in between, you've got a whole range of possibilities. But my real view on all of it collectively is it's all part of the balance of countryside life and what makes it work. There are aspects of it that I personally don't particularly agree with. For example, I'm not a big fan of shoots that shoot hundreds and hundreds of pheasants in a day because I just regard it as pointless. But that's my opinion and my personal taste. Similarly, I'm not particularly keen on shooting geese. I just don't like it. But that's not to say that it's wrong. And for my part, the activity of shooting and the husbandry of the wildlife and the management of it adds to the countryside. It's all part of it. And if you take it away, the balance changes, not necessarily for the better. Ray, you go shooting, don't you? I do. I've got a couple of dogs that I take shooting and I use them for picking up the birds once they've been shot and th that's what they purely do. I think that as Phil says the the big shoots that have loads of birds coming over in one flush and they're all just banging away at them mindlessly is not sport but I do think that the when they you have a flush of pheasants out and they go for them and they uh, shoot a few down the picking up part of it for me is great because it's such a joy to have bred a dog that will go and gently pick up a bird and bring it back to you. It's, it's just great. But the accusation that is, you know, levied at you folk, quite fairly in my opinion, is what you're doing is not sustainable. You've actually bred those pheasants to be killed. You know, what you're doing isn't necessarily a great thing. Partly, but that's not totally the case in as much that we try to maintain a wild population of pheasants and we try not to shoot the whole lot to extinction every year. And that's what I mean, that the difference between commercial shoots who put down thousands of poults, young pheasants, and, and then have this sort of carnage, if you like, for want of a better word, when they come to shoot them, isn't the same as what Rach and I are on about, where... The act of shooting the pheasant is only part of the story. The vermin control, the management of the woodland, picking the pheasant, well, getting the pheasant to fly in a sporting manner. You know, it, it's, it's, if, you, if you have pheasants that come over you not very high and, and they're easy to hit, where's the sport in that? There's, you might as well go and shoot clays. But a lot of people would say that you should not be getting your sport from killing animals? I think that that's a little bit unfair given that certainly in our case, and I know Rachel's shoot is the same, that we eat all that we shoot. Hmm. You know, it's important to know that this isn't just for the joy of killing them, 
They're all eaten one way or another, and there's a certain amount of tradition involved. And also the act of managing your shoot is part and a very important part of the balance of the wildlife within that area. And I know that balance goes wrong if you just overrun the place with pheasants. I don't think that's right. So stepping back a moment, can you tell me how your shoot works So from day one? Because it's not a question that you go out and find vermin that are causing a problem like rabbits, shoot them and then bring them home for the pot. It is actually that you breed the pheasants in the first place. Can, so can you explain how that's good or bad for the surrounding wood? Basically, the management of a shoot is conducted by a group of people one way or another. It doesn't really matter what sort of shoot it is. But included in the management of that shoot are the vermin control within the shoot area. Now, without the shoot, the vermin control doesn't get done. So that basically the, the existence of a shoot means that both vermin in terms of rabbits and foxes are kept to manageable levels and vermin in terms of birds such as crows and, and the like and pigeons are also kept to manageable levels. Now they when may you not say vermin, that, you know, they're not vermin. I mean vermin means that they're bad things but are you talking about wiping them out? Or? No. No, what I'm talking about is that because of the, you know, obviously pigeons don't necessarily have a great impact on the shoot, but they do have an impact on the surrounding farming. And because of the existence of the shoot, the control of pigeons is usually undertaken by the shoot. And it's that sort of relationship that helps. If the shoot isn't there, then you don't get to control those things, which then cause problems elsewhere. And to some extent, we're seeing this um, we made comment some podcasts ago that the number of badgers has doubled since the early 1990s when they became protected. Prior to that, shoots and the like would have controlled their numbers. They didn't wipe them out and they didn't set out to wipe them out, but they would have controlled their numbers. And now we've got the situation where their numbers aren't controlled and the population has exploded. The same would happen with foxes, rabbits, pigeons, crows if they weren't thinned out from time to time. In our case, the same is true of the deer. They're lovely things, but if they're left to their own devices, they will breed to the point of destroying the woodland, eating all the crops, and just generally making a nuisance of themselves. So bad for the wildlife as Absolutely. well as the crops. And the point is that with these animals that have few or no predators, other than man, this balance can only be maintained by man, because... We haven't got any wolves or grizzly bears or anything to, to undertake the job for us. So tell me what happens with your shoot. With our shoot, we have a group of around 20 people who all chip in equally to the cost of conducting the shoot, and there is a cost, and they help run it, although we have two or three who do most of the gamekeeping work between them, so that they maintain the vermin control and they maintain the physical things like the release pens where the young pheasants are put to start with so the fox can't get at them. And they also help to prepare the drives so that they make sure that they're safe and that they provide sporting shooting so that the birds fly high enough and you can pick up the shot birds safely. And we basically, our shoot runs in, in, with the idea that the birds are put down during the summer and they're grown through the late summer and then our first shoot will be on the 8th of November, so that from then through until the end of January, we will have regular shoot days where we have roughly six drives in a day, and we split our 20-odd people in half, so half beat and half stand, and then we swap round. So What's have, a beat? Beat is when you have a line of people who walk through the drive, tapping their sticks and working spaniels and the like, to make sure that the pheasants fly up and over the guns who are stood at the far end of the drive usually. Is that you then, Rach? Occasionally I do that, but I would prefer to use the dogs for picking up. So where are you while this is happening? Right, well, if I'm picking up, I'm actually stood uh, 20, 30 yards behind the guns. So right. there's a line of guns um, that are shooting the birds being pushed out by the beaters. So then when the birds drop, they're being picked up by a picker-up behind the shooter. And that's you, yeah. with your dog. With my lovey, 
What's he called? <laughs> Spice. 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 Is that after the Spice Girls, was it? <laughs> well, she's she's lovely. She's a lovey. Just it's like important. Tony Ra- Black. Rachel's job is is critical, because if a bird is clean shot, that's fine. It's dead, and the dog goes and collects it. But it's also important that if a bird is not cleanly shot, that it's obviously collected and dispatched quickly and efficiently, yeah. and that is Rachel's yeah. job. Even if a bird is shot, it can get up and run, and what we don't want is injured birds about the place, so it's important that a dog is sent off immediately to go and find that bird and bring it back. And what is your response to people who would say, this is cruel, stop? My response to those is that I'm not suggesting that everybody should either indulge in or approve of country sports. What I am saying is that it's part of country life, that it is a sustainable and important part of the balance that is the countryside, and it is no more or less cruel than when a fox gets into your chicken run or whatever. It is life, that in order to eat things, we have to kill them. And that's, that's the bottom line. And what would your response be to somebody who said, this is a sport for toffs, you're just off your head, you've turned into a snob, Phil, you've got your plus fours on, <laughs> get a life. Mind, he doesn't wear plus fours. I was going to say, have you seen my plus fours? <laughs> he normally goes out in the same gear that's on the back of the uh, catalogue. <laughs> he does. But anyway. I would have to say that for, for our shoot, that I can obviously speak for, that we encompass every possible walk of life so that we've got everybody from an airline pilot right down to two or three of our, our most staunch members are unemployed but they live passionately for their spaniels and shooting and so that we, we cover every possibility. We've got hairdressers, we've got an airline pilot, we've got assorted farmers, timber fallers, everybody and yeah. that's the that's the key to a good shoot is to be all inclusive well, that's your shoot and our shoot which isn't that far away is exactly the same so you know now i must off. tell you listener that we actually recorded a podcast all about shooting last year and we were going to bring it to you and we chickened out because we just weren't sure if that was the best thing to do so here's our taster session on shooting we would love to hear your opinions obviously Lots of you aren't going to agree with the shoot, but I really do think it's valuable to hear that not all shoots are going out and doing things that I would consider to be unsustainable. Not all shoots are using pheasants as sport without eating the bird. And not all shoots, in my opinion, are cruel. But we'd like to hear from you. So... You can email heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk. Phil, which is... pwg at lowerblakemere.co.uk. There's loads more I know that Phil wants to say on the benefits of the balance and how the shoot contributes to um, other things like the local economy. But I've cut him off because we've got to move on because I really want to talk about nettles. Hooray! Here comes Ricky. (laughs) Morning, Ricky. Morning. We're going to talk a bit about nettles. I wish Richard was here because he knows all about nettles. But just to give you an idea, the stinging nettle is one of the most important native plants for wildlife in the whole of the UK. It supports 40 species of insect, including some of our most colourful butterflies. I think the Red Admiral loves it. And it's the first nectar plant for ladybirds as they wake up in the spring. But here came Ricky with with a a letter. Tell us all about it, Rick. It was sent to my father in 29th of May, 1946. That was long before I was born. Where did he live then? Little Jew Church. In Herefordshire. Yeah, yeah. and it's from E. Griffiths Hughes Limited in Salford in Manchester. And they were asking people to send nettles, were urgently required for medical purposes. Right. Medicinal purposes, and they paid generous prices according to the grade, up to, well, what was a quarter of a penny then would be... A farthing, was it? Mm. A pound for stripped right. leaves or ten pence a pound for whole plants. Wow. There's instructions how to do it here. I thought it was quite interesting for Heather to look at. How do you send your nettles in? 
dried stripped nettles or whole dried nettles without roots are required. That was toast. <laughs> I think she's got a nettle Sneezing. on her nose, hasn't she? <laughs> it, yes. Get those nettles off that dog, Bill. <laughs> You could collect them over the whole of the season, but the plant should be the dark green colour, healthy and free from blight, and free from contamination with other plants or dust. Gathered by hand, scythe, garden shears or sickle. Now, what is a sickle, Phil? A sickle, uh, well, a proper sickle, is um, a thing like the, the Grim Reaper uses. You know, a oh, two-handed, yes, I know. Oh, yeah. Um, but, or a, sort of what you and I might use would be a hand-held one or perhaps a long-handled sickle, which would be just one of those on the end of a broom handle type. No, thing. Phil, what you'd use was a strimmer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you dried them, tie them in bundles and hang them indoors in a warm place and protect them from rain. And so did your dad do this? I don't know. Ooh, I think he was just it. trying to make some money, as you did then, <laughs> didn't he? <you? laughs> anyway, I found out a bit about Griffiths and Hughes, because I wondered Ooh. what wonderful cures they made out of mm. the, the nettles. Anyway, they were sold to a company in Australia, and they made cushion salts. So I think that the nettles are in the cushion salt, because, as we all know, nettles are very good for tummy upsets. And cushion salts, which actually are still available these days. But you know these things that cure everything? Mm -hmm. And it says that these cushion salts fix gout, rheumatism, lumbago, eczema, constipation. That took you five things to get Gosh. to the belly, eh? Yeah. I see there, unless you get Richard. gout in the belly. I was going to say, Richard could have yeah. done some yeah. of those. Liver and kidney disorders, and it removes uric acid from the blood. Mm. So there we are. Um, and I've been looking up a little bit about nettle tea too. I don't know if you can make some of this, Rick. I thought perhaps you mm, might grab make dry, some. Yeah. You've got to dry the nettles and then apparently it's very good for your tummy. Well, they were very good for getting my husband out of bed. What? Because my <laughs> mother-in-law used to get a handful of nettles when he wouldn't get up and whip him down his legs in the bed with his nettles. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's particularly cruel. Come yes, on. but apparently it worked. <laughs> Does it still work, Rick? Or I could try it and let you know. <laughs> well, nettles are full of loads of minerals. Calcium, magnesium, iron, potassium, phosphorus, manganese, silica, iodine, silicon, sodium and sulphur. They provide chlorophyll and tannin. They're a great sort of vitamin C, beta carotene and B complex vitamins. They have high levels of easily absorbable amino acids. They're 10% protein, more than any other vegetable. Mm. What about that then? Are all nettles the same or are we just talking about stinging nettles? Stinging nettles seem to be the key thing. They now freeze dry them and they are traditional food for people with allergies. Oh, very good. So I've got the recipe for nettle tea mm. and I know that we've got a bit of a witch in the room. Yes. So what do you reckon, Ricky? <laughs> yes, I'll have a go. Could right, we'll have a nettle. It was on the, on the telly the other day, the nettle soup, so that you take the nettles and blanch them and then make a sauce. I think they were using yoghurt or possibly creme fraiche, but I think it was basically yoghurt, so you make a creamy nettle soup, and that was That's said right. to be very good. Do we dare to make that or stick with the tea? Whatever. They all talk about nettles in the spring, but as we're in the autumn, we're going to have mm. to have autumnal nettles. But we must remember not to take them off the roadside because ah. all sorts of toxins are from car from fumes cars. and things. Yeah. Right. right. They must be out of the field. Not to worry, we've got plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> and you've also got here the Dutchy Originals Cookbook. Yes, and it's lovely. Ah, this is a new Wiggly book. Looks beautiful. And you've been in here, haven't you, Ricky? I have been in here because, as you know, in Cornwall they do beautiful pasties. Cornish like pasties. Cornish pasties. What's the meat in a Cornish pasty? Well, I was just going to ask the question because I think a true Cornish pasty doesn't have meat in it. It's a lot of carrots, a lot of potatoes, and yeah. you either have well, originally, mutton or beef. Don't I was going to say, mm. but I think originally they were for fairly poor fishing people. And the idea was that it was vegetables and you could hold on to it by the crust with your dirty hands where you've been fishing and what have you. And you could eat the pasty and then chuck the crust over the side of the boat. I think the miners had them and they had their dinner part in the one side and then the dessert in the other side of the pasty. Oh. Originally, that's what they so did. So what page are we on, Rick? We're on page 26. 26. 
lamb and Madeira Cornish pasta. That sounds much better. But it's the um, pastry recipe I'm interested in because you can never make pastry like they do in Cornwall. No. And I'm what's just. The, what's too. the secret? Well, I'm hoping this is the secret in this book. And what's the recipe then? What the ingredients? It's on page 204, the recipe for the pastry. I should be baking some of these and letting you sample them. Well, Ah, so it's got suet in it? Yes. Is that the key, I wonder? I wonder in that. Well, we'll see. Yes. So we've got nettle tea and pasties coming up from Ricky. Yes. So that will be in podcast 54. Right. Which is next week. You and I won't be here, Phil. But it's a Ricardo, a Ricky and Rach podcast. (laughs) The three R's are in town. (laughs) So if you want to join in on the tasting, well... Tune in to next week's podcast, 54. Typical of Ricardo to turn up for the food. Food, eh? yes. <laughs> and they're not from Tesco. <laughs> oh, I was intrigued by the note on the bottom, because, of course, in 46, there was nothing much about immediately post-war. And on the, bo- on the bottom, it says, P.S., in the interest of paper economy, may we suggest you use the back of this sheet for your reply? Ah, yeah. so he didn't reply See? then, did he? So he no. didn't reply. No, I said he was only trying to make yeah. money. It, it is yeah. interesting how there's nothing new in recycling, is there? No. Yeah. You know, when they didn't have any. Oh, on the subject of not wasting paper, I've got an email from Chris Shaw who's concerned about packaging. He's concerned that some of our packaging is not recyclable or compostable. He had a discussion with somebody and they assured that 25 kilos of wiggly seed extra would be in paper sacks. He also says that some of the items in the birdie box were plastic wrapped. And so I was able to address that because we have actually changed our packaging from our paper sacks for 12 and a half kilos to woven polyprop, which sounds bad. But as I explained to him, when we were using our paper sacks, and you can vouch for me on this, Rick, mm-hmm. we were having to repack them in woven polypop bags yeah, because anyway, yeah. they split, split, didn't they? Yeah, in the bags, yeah. So what we've done is we've put them in a woven polypop bag, but you can return that bag to us, and we will reuse it at some point. The same with tubs. Folk send their send tubs back, back in, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they do. do. We have regular customers yeah. that send their mealworm tubs back to mm-hmm. us. And yeah. They get recycled. And mm-hmm. so the upshot is when we can pack it in paper, we certainly... Do. But if we're doubling up and using plastic as well, well, it's much better us just pack the whole thing into the woven polypop bag, we think. It certainly saves the customer having a split bag. So we've done our best. I've emailed back to Chris and I've waited for his response in case he's got any fantastic ideas of new packaging materials that we should be using, which I will be very pleased to do so. We've got another note here from Amy Ponsetti, who's in San Francisco. So presumably she got to listen to us from the article in the San Francisco Chronicle. She says she's now addicted, but she wants to know more about hedgerows. She's fascinated because they're not that common in America, and she's hoping that we'll recommend a book on their history and composition. (laughs) She says then, fully informed, she can pick sides and join the battle. Sorry, discussion. And so we've got a book coming in called Hedgerow History. It will be in the Wiggly bookshelves within the next couple of weeks. And it's by Jerry Barnes and Tom Williamson. And it looks absolutely wonderful. Sam's just ordering that now. So if you want to know more about hedgerows, you can get this book. I think it's on Amazon too. We've got a couple of reviews left, so I'll get Ricky to read out one because we're fed up of reading out reviews. But we're very grateful for you sending them in, so please carry on. Here is a review from Amy Ponsetti. Can you read that out, Rick? Yeah. My favourite podcast, five stars. Wiggly Wiggly's podcast is not a how-to or time to plant reworking of the same old stuff. Simply put, it's what's interesting to the Wiggly team. Books, events, blogs, people and other podcasts. The topics they cover are amazingly diverse. Each week after listening, I research for hours to learn more. Thanks, Wiggly team, for encouraging my garden interests past the limits of my own fence. And the last one on the US iTunes site, Funny and Bright, five stars from ncnpodcast.com. I love this cast. Brilliant. Well produced. Thank you, Michael. Hilarious and smart. Trust me, you will love this cast too. Hope you do. It's over to Monty. The Wiggly Worm Cash Podcast by Monty. 
a weekly fact on slowworms. Slowworms are the most commonly seen reptile in Britain. Adults have a smooth, shiny appearance and a grey or bluish belly. Thank you, Monty. So from the Wiggly Sofa for one more week, it's by from me, Heather. Right. Farmer Phil. Ricky. Can't wait for those pastas. Wish I was here. <laughs> Bring one for Michael. Bye. <laughs> And the last one is a quickie that says Funny and Bright, five stars, ncnpodcast.com. I love this cast, brilliant. Oh, sorry, I told them the <laughs> cat <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Did you hear that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Noah. <laughs> Toast it down. Good girl. Good girl. Oh. Oh. Good girl.